a lonely frog telephoned the psychic hotline and asked what his future held. His personal psychic advisor tells him, you're going to meet a beautiful young girl who will want to know everything about you. The frog is thrilled. This is great. Will I meet her at a party? He croaks. No, says the psychic, in biology class. <laughs> All right. <laughs> if you have your Bible there, turn, if you will, to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, and we'll be jumping around the Bible. So if you need one, please use those in the pew. It'll be the same as I'm using, and the page number will be the same, and that'll help you uh, considerably. John chapter 1, look if you will with me please at verse 12, which says, But as many as received Him. Salvation is receiving a person, not a set of rituals or rules or denomination or an organization, but you'll notice eternal life is in a person. And that person is God who took on flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ. But as many as received Him, to them gave He, that is, God gave power or authority to become the sons of God. When a person receives Christ, they become born again into the family of God and become a son or daughter and God gives that authority for you to become born again at the moment of belief, at the moment you receive Christ. The last phrase tells us how we receive Christ. It says, to them that believe on His name. The word believe means best in English, trust. When you T-R-U-S-T, -T, trust that Jesus Christ is God who took on flesh that he came into this world to go to the cross and that he died and shed his blood and died to pay for your sins, was buried and rose again from the dead, God uh, grants you authority to become God's son or daughter. We are not God's sons or daughters until we trust Christ as Savior. A lot of people teach or think that we're all God's children. That's not true. God is our creator we're his creation, but we're not his son or daughter until we receive Christ as Savior, till we're born again. So not until then. If you pray, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and you haven't trusted Christ, then you're praying wrong because God is not your Father. Uh, you're not praying to God as your Father because you're not saved. And if you're not saved, if you're not a believer, then uh, God is not your Father. And the Bible is very clear uh, throughout that that is the case. And I never knew that. I never knew that at all. In fact, I believed and was raised to believe that we're all God's children and God is the Father of all. But that is not what the Bible teaches. God is the Creator of all and we're all His creation. But we're not His sons, nor are we His daughters. And He is not our Father until we trust Jesus Christ as Savior. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. So the only way you can approach the Father, the only way you can have God as your Father, is through Christ. And when you trust Him, then you become saved and you become His child. Notice the verse says, But as many as received Him, to them gave God, or God gave, or granted authority, for you to become the sons of God. What is so interesting is that today, a lot of times people talk about how to be saved and they'll tell you to give your life or to give your heart to Christ to be saved. And people just say, well, that's, that's okay, isn't it? And the answer is no, because think for just a minute, it's the exact opposite of what we find here in the Bible. Notice in this verse, God is the giver, and we're the receivers. Notice, God grants authority. He gave authority for those that believe to become His sons. To as many as receive Christ, 
as their Savior. So God is always the giver, and we're always the receivers as far as salvation is concerned. In John 16, you read it, For God so loved the world that He gave, He gave, He gave His only begotten Son. We find that wherever you look, salvation is expressed as the gift of God. The gift of God, Romans 6.23 says, is eternal life. The gift of God. It's God's gift. He's the giver. We're the receivers. So He gives us eternal life as a gift. We receive it when we trust Christ as our Savior. So to tell uh, someone that they have to give anything to God to be saved is exactly the opposite. That makes you the giver and God the receiver when the Bible says that God is the giver and we're the receivers. So to try to say to somebody, give your heart to Christ or give your life to Christ is 180 degrees out of phase. It's the exact opposite of what the Bible teaches. God is the giver. We're the receivers. And the moment you trust Christ, you receive that gift of eternal life. You receive Christ by trusting that Christ died for you. And it is so wrong, and yet it seems to be accepted within Christianity all the time. It's amazing to me. And of course, I like to tease and make fun just to get people's attention, to make it stick in your mind. But why give your heart? Why didn't they choose the liver? Give your liver to Christ. Or give your pancreas, or your thyroid, or maybe your tonsils or your adenoids. You want to get rid of those anyway, maybe. So just give those to Jesus. The Bible doesn't say give anything. Obviously, if we give anything, that's the opposite of what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that God is the giver. We're the receivers. To try to give anything to God to be saved would be wrong. And then, of course, in my sanctified imagination, based on that kind of theology, I had imagined in heaven that there are great big containers everywhere where people have given their hearts to Jesus, and this one's full to the brim with hearts. And this one over here is filled with hearts. And over here we have another giant container with hearts in it. It's kind of ridiculous when you really think about the ramifications of it. And God doesn't need your heart. It's amazing to me that we have just such bad terminology. And also we're told sometimes to invite Jesus into our heart equally incorrect and non-biblical. I heard a true story just this week of a little boy and he was sitting watching television with his grandfather and they were watching one of these surgery programs where they were doing an open heart surgery. And after it was all over, the bright little boy said to his grandfather, Grandpa, does that mean if that man had invited Jesus into his heart, now that he's got a new heart, does he have to invite Jesus to come into the new heart? I mean, this is how crazy it is and how children are so literal. They know a little bit in school about the heart. and They say, well, which chamber will he live in? Chamber number one, chamber number two, chamber number three, or maybe chamber number four. And then other children say, well, won't he get blood all over him? These are all great questions, and kids are smarter than adults sometimes because adults can just let this all pass and, and not think about the consequences of what they're saying. But with children, they take it so literally, and it's very, very misleading. We don't give anything to God to be saved, and we don't invite Christ into our heart to be saved. The Bible says that the last phrase of verse 12 here, to those that what believe, that word means to trust on his name, and his name, Jesus, literally means that he is God who would save you. It comes from two Hebrew words, uh, God's personal name, Yahweh, and the word for salvation, Yasha, and the contraction is Yeshua, and Yeshua in English is Jesus. And so when you believe on what his name means, you become saved. It's really that simple. So when you believe that Jesus is God, who took on flesh and died to pay for your sin, God saves you. And most people uh, just goes right over their head and they don't realize that it's wrong. And I myself was a victim of inviting Jesus into your heart for the first 18 years of my life. It wasn't until I was 18 that I realized that I had to trust that Christ died for me and shed his blood as a payment for my sin. And if I only would trust him, 
I would be saved. So the way you receive Christ, verse 12, to as many as received him, to, the, to them God gave authority for them to become born again, to become the sons of God, to them that believe or trust on his name. That's the way you receive him. The word even there is in italics. Italicized words are not in the original manuscripts. And you might as well scratch them out. Because uh, oftentimes they take away from the meaning. And you might just read them, uh, read the verses without the italicized words. You do better, I think, when you do that. Let's now go to the Old Testament. We're going to go to Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36. Here we have an amazing prophecy about the nation of Israel. And here Ezekiel gives us this prophecy about 587 B.C. Ezekiel was what we call an exile prophet. What does that mean? In B.C. 606, when Nebuchadnezzar, king of the empire of Babylon, came against Jerusalem and conquered it, he destroyed the temple in the city and carried away the Jews captive into Babylon or Iraq. And Ezekiel was one of those young men carried away in that captivity along with Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, you've heard of all those characters. Those were all young men that were carried away captive. And we find that Ezekiel lived in northern Iraq, and Daniel was down in the capital of Iraq at that time, which was the ancient city of Babylon. And we find that there are prophets who were pre-exile. That means they lived and spoke before the Jews were carried away into exile 70 years into Babylon or Iraq. And there are prophets that are post-exile. That means that they lived and preached after the exile of the Jews into Iraq. And there are those who are exile prophets who lived and preached during the 70 years. Ezekiel was one of those who was, a carried, who was carried away captive and actually lived and preached during that time. He writes a fairly large book. That's why he's called one of the major prophets. I always was confused as a brand new believer saying, what's the difference between a major prophet and a minor prophet? And I thought, well, a minor prophet couldn't have much to say. It was of any worth, so I don't think I'll read those books. And a major prophet, boy, they're important, and they're the ones that you really need to pay attention to. And of course, uh, that is not the case. A major prophet is merely called a major prophet because he writes a long book. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel are all major prophets. And then we have smaller books written by other prophets like Daniel 12 chapters and, and uh, Hosea, I think it's uh, about 7 or 8 chapters, Micah 7 chapters. I know these are smaller prophets. Joel the prophet only wrote 3 chapters and so they're called minor prophets. But they're not minor in importance because Oftentimes, they're the hardest-hitting books of the Old Testament, filled with gems and wonderful truths about the end times. But Ezekiel is a major prophet, and he wrote during the exile while Israel was in this uh, uh, land of Iraq. And look at what God says here in this wonderful prophecy in chapter 36, page 880. It says here, I will, verse 24, Take you from among the heathen, is the word in the King James, but if you'll notice in the margin, it probably should better be translated nations. I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of what? All countries. And will bring you into your own land. So we notice here that he would gather them out of the nations. Obviously, this prophecy looked beyond that captivity where Ezekiel was part of. It looked beyond to a day when the Jews would be scattered worldwide and how they would be regathered back into their land. Notice he says here in verse 28, And you shall dwell 
in the land that I gave to your fathers. It refers to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and of course Jacob's twelve sons, which became the twelve tribes of Israel. I will cause you, it says, you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. It then tells us about the last days, which we're living in now, where it says in uh, verse 34, And the desolate land shall be tilled, whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that passed by. You know, Israel, up until... Uh, 1948 pretty much was just like all the other land over there in the Middle East, uh, pretty much uh, desert and desolate, and nothing was productive about it. But you know now, uh, the whole Middle East is jealous of Israel because they have taken this land and they have developed it, and it is now the breadbasket of the Middle East, and they export uh, all kinds of citrus and other uh, crops to all the nations of the world. They grow everything from bananas to cotton to peanuts uh, to all kinds of fresh vegetables and fruits. I know when we were there just a couple of months ago, uh, just being there for two weeks and eating all that uh, wonderful food they have, you just feel better. I think it's uh, just so nutritious. People would say, wow, look at that tomato, or wow, look at that orange, or Whatever it was, it just looked healthy and vibrant. And of course, uh, they have some just beautiful, beautiful fruits and vegetables that are grown right there in Israel. And obviously, I think you can tell the difference as you eat them. The land is rich. It's been laid desolate for 2,000 years while the Jewish people have been scattered around the world. And now we find that they're beginning to cultivate that. The Bible predicts that. It says the desolate land shall be what? Tilled. And the Jewish people, which have gone back to the land from all over the world, primarily were involved in everything but farming. But they've become an agricultural nation, as well as one of the leading technological nations in the world. But they've gone back and tilled the land, farmed the land. It says verse 35, And they shall say, This land that was desolate has become like what? The Garden of Eden. And wow, I think if you visit Israel, you'll see that. What beauty you'll see in all the valleys and that are green and uh, that are being cultivated. And they grow all kinds of fruits and, and every kind of uh, vegetable you might imagine. And it says, the waste and desolate ruined cities are become fenced and are inhabited. Then it says in verse 36, then the nations that are left around about you shall know that I, the Lord, build the ruined places and plant that which was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. Now let's go, if you will, to chapter 37. Here we have now God in vision and in pictures describing how he would bring the Jewish people back to their land. And they became a nation for the first time again in 2,000 years in May of 19. 48. Israel has just celebrated her 60th anniversary of being a nation. And you have to recall that Israel was not a nation for the past 2,000 years. Here we have in chapter 37 what we call the vision of dry bones. <clears throat> the hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the, very, in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Well, here it's talking about the nation of Israel. How do we know? Look, if you will, at verse 11. Here we have the interpretation, and usually you'll find the Bible is very good about interpreting a passage very close by in the same text. And here we have it in verse 11. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are what? The whole house of Israel. So we have the bones representing Israel. And this is talking about a nation that has been dead and buried for 2,000 years. 
The graveyard is the nations. And the Bible says in the last days that those that are living as Jews in the last days would come up out of these nations, out of the graves, and return back into their land and become a nation again. Notice it says in verse 21, And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among what? The heathen that should read nations, whither thou, uh, whither uh, they be gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them where? Into their own land. So the Bible talks about they're being brought out of the nations and brought into their land. Out of the nations and into their land, and they're there today. This is an amazing prophecy that is fulfilled right now. If you were to say, uh, show me some evidence that the Bible is the Word of God, this is pretty powerful. God here speaks thousands of years ago about a people that would be dispersed worldwide, would absolutely be dead as a nation, not in their land, buried in these different nations, and it seemed like a graveyard. Impossible for the nation to revive and come back as a nation. And God said, yet I'm going to bring them up out of these nations, the graveyard, and I'll bring them into their land, and they'll become a nation again. And what incredible words we're reading here, because we're living now, seeing it take place. I don't know about you, but this truly excited me when I first saw these passages. I remember as a little boy singing the <clears throat> spiritual about the dry bones, and you probably have heard it, I'm sure. Them bones, them bones, gonna rock around them bones, them bones. And it's all about how the bones would come back together and become alive again. It's not talking about <clears throat> uh, Jewish people that have died being in the resurrection, although all Jews who have believed on their Messiah will be in the resurrection of the saved, and all Jews that have not will not be in the resurrection of the saved, just like we as Gentiles. But it's talking about Jewish people as a nation in the end times, the Jewish people living would come back into their land. Then we find God outlines how it would take place. Notice he says in verse 5 of Exodus, or rather Ezekiel 37, Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and bring flesh upon you, and, and cover you with skin, and put, my, uh, put breath in you, and you shall live. And you shall know that I am the Lord. Verse 7 says, so I commanded, so I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, and there are five things here you might want to make note of. It says here, there was a noise. The word noise in the Hebrew means a cry, a crying out. We find that God, when Israel cried out in Egypt, under the taskmasters of the Pharaoh, God said he heard their cry, and he came down to do something about it. And he raised up Moses to lead them out of Egypt. Here, God has heard the cry of the people, and this cry was the beginning. And I believe it was the persecutions that came upon the Jewish people in Europe and other parts of the world prior to their becoming a nation. We know what Hitler did, and we know how he brought great uh, tribulation upon the Jewish people and exterminated six million Jewish people. Then it says here, there was a shaking, and that means the Jews were being shaken up. They were being moved. They were running. They were fleeing. They were looking for a place to go. And you know, nobody in this world wanted them. The countries of the world shut their doors to them, and so they were really being slaughtered. And then, of course, finally the opportunity arose for them to go into the ancient homeland and become a nation again. And what happened? These Jews began to shake and move and began to uproot from where they were 
raised and lived for many, many centuries, it says the bones came together, bone to his bone. I believe that's the Jewish people coming back from this country, from that country, from this country, from that country, back into their land, and now they're united again as a people in the land of Israel. And obviously in 1948, they declared their independence and their statehood. And then it says here in verse 8, And behold, and when I beheld, lo, the sinews and flesh came upon them. That speaks about the muscles and the tendons, and that provides coordination between the, the bones, right? If you just have bones, they've got to be connected by sinews and by muscles, and we find that these ligaments allow for uh, coordination and movement, and so the nation becomes uh, obviously an operating government, an operating people with uh, government and with all the other things that they need uh, to facilitate being a living nation. And then it says here in verse uh, 8, and skin covered them above. Skin was the final of the fifth or the five stages here, and skin speaks about protection. You know, the skin protects your body from infection, uh, from invasion, uh, it keeps everything internally uh, covered, and uh, it speaks, I believe, of Israel developing an army, a defense force. You know, when they became a nation in 1948, they did not have an army. And in fact, on the very day that they declared their statehood in May of 1948, six Arab nations declared war on Israel. And uh, they all had armies. But amazingly, God allowed Israel to win when they didn't even have an army. It was an amazing uh, tale of God's protection upon this people as they bring them back into the land. And they've had four major wars since then, and obviously God has protected them in every case. He has brought them back, I believe, to stay. And then it says in verse uh, 9, uh, in the end of verse 8, rather, there was no breath in them. I believe that speaks about salvation and that how that they would become saved and the very breath of God, the Spirit of God, would indwell them. And that really won't happen until after the rapture during the tribulation period. And so it says in verse 9, Therefore prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. And so I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. And so we find here that I believe after the rapture, during the tribulation, is when many, many Jewish people are going to come to accept their Messiah, and God, the Holy Spirit, will come and uh, indwell these believers. And then it says, of course, in verse 11, we'll go back and take a look at the summary verse. He said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried, our hope is lost, we are cut off from our parts. That is the cry of the Jewish people for the past 2,000 years. We're separated from our fellow Jews. Uh, we're dead as a nation. Uh, there's no hope. What are we going to do? And it looked impossible. And as we talked about last week with replacement theology in Christianity, beginning in the 5th century, they said, yes, that's true. God is done with Israel. There is no hope for them. They're not going to be able to do anything. And they said that the church replaced Israel, which is not true. And we covered that hopefully thoroughly enough last week. But we find that uh, God is not done with Israel. And he has a plan. And we're living right now when that plan is about to be fulfilled with the Jewish people back in the state of Israel. And so it says here in verse 12, Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves, which are the nations where the Jewish people have been over the past 2,000 years, cause you to come up out of these graves, these nations, and bring you into the land of Israel. Notice the phrase here, I will cause you to come up out of your graves, so they'll come out of the nations, and then the last phrase says, bring you into the land. So they come out of the nations, and then they go into the promised land, into the land of Israel. 
And that is the prophecy. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves. This is truly a miracle of God that has happened involving millions of people over thousands of years, and it's happening before our very eyes. Verse 15 says, The word of the Lord came unto me again, saying, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel his companions. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph the stick of Ephraim and for all the house of Israel his companions. And join them together uh, and join them one to another into one stick and they shall become one in thy hand. What it's talking about here is that after Solomon, Rehoboam, Solomon's son, divided the kingdom. And there were ten tribes to the north, and they were called Israel in the Old Testament. And there were two tribes in the south, and they were called Judah. And so often you'll read about Judah and Israel, and because the nation was divided. And the people of Israel, the ten northern tribes, worshipped in Samaria. And they were obviously uh, out of tune with God's plan because Jerusalem was the place to worship. And Judah and Benjamin, those two tribes, remain in the south. And uh, they have been divided really ever since. And the Bible says in the last days that they will be joined together and become one people. In other words, all 12 tribes would be represented in the land of Israel and all of the nation, Judah and Israel, the ten in the north, the two in the south, would be joined together and become one stick. And it's saying here that they will be joined together. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, uh, Wilt thou not show us what thou meanest by these? Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his fellows, and will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in my hand. So it's very plain, isn't it? He's going to put the whole nation back together in the land, and I believe we're seeing that even right now. All 12 tribes are represented back in the state of Israel right now. And it'll be one nation, not a divided nation, as Rehoboam had split it after Solomon, the son of uh, Solomon. They'll be back in the land as one nation. And we find it says here in verse 22, I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all. And they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. No more, no more will it be the ten tribes to the north and the two to the south. It will be one united nation. And that's exactly what we're seeing in Israel today. This is Bible prophecy. And look, if you will, down in verse 25. And they shall dwell in the land that I've given unto Jacob. Remember, Jacob was the grandson of Abraham. God had promised to Abraham all that land in the Middle East. And Abraham's son was Isaac, and his son was Jacob, and his twelve sons were the twelve tribes, which here are shown as being reunited back in the land. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt. That is, the fathers prior to the exile. Remember, before the exile, uh, their fathers and fathers, fathers had lived in Israel. But now Nebuchadnezzar carried him away into Iraq. And now God is saying, I'm going to ultimately take you back to that land where your fathers, the ones that Ezekiel is preaching to in Iraq, and I'll take them back to that very land where your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein. And they and their children and their children's children forever. So you'll notice it's very clear that this is a promise that goes on forever. The Jewish people will be restored back to their land, and this would be in the last days. Moreover, verse 26, I'll make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be what? An everlasting king, a covenant. 
when Jesus comes back, the Messiah comes back, at the end of the seven years of tribulation after the rapture, there will be peace on earth, goodwill toward men, and that peace will then continue for eternity. And it says here, notice, I will place them and multiply them, and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forever. His sanctuary is the temple, which does not exist right now. But that temple will be rebuilt, and I believe shortly after the rapture. You know, I was at the Temple Mount Institute just a couple of months ago in Jerusalem, and uh, all, the, all the preparations have been made for the rebuilding of the third temple. And there has now been a Sanhedrin constituted in Israel for the first time in 2,000 years. And this Sanhedrin is all about wanting to rebuild that temple. And uh, so it looks like more and more awareness and more and more Jewish desire to rebuild the temple. And we certainly saw evidence of that everywhere when we just uh, uh, returned. We saw that in Israel. And notice the sanctuary here would be placed in the midst of them forever. His sanctuary is where the Messiah will come and rule the earth uh, from. My tabernacle, verse 27, that is the temple, shall also shall be with them, yea, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And the nations shall know that I, the Lord, doth sanctify Israel, when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. Once that happens, once they have their third temple, and the Messiah comes back to it, everybody will know from then on that Israel has been uh, placed back into their land, just like he said that they would. These are most exciting passages, and they are really a prelude to what is going to happen. In chapter 38, I just briefly want to say that when the Messiah comes, he'll come at a time when Russia becomes involved in the Middle East and comes down against Israel. And the whole world will really come to war over the Middle East. And I think we can see the handwriting on the wall as these things are starting to come down. But it says here in verse 19 of chapter 38, Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. Verse 20, so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon, please notice, upon the face of the earth shall shake at what? My presence. My presence is the return of Christ. When God comes back in the person of Jesus Christ, the second time he will shake the earth and all the men on the whole earth will know that he has returned and he will establish the nation of Israel forever as uh, his people. And uh, this is a, an amazing passage here because it talks about the whole earth will shake and there will be a great shaking in the land of Israel at his presence. This is when the Messiah returns back to the earth. I believe we're getting very close to these events. Look, if you will, now in Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And this will be on page 1106. It says in verse 25, And these are the words of Jesus when he was here the first time, the Messiah here the first time came to die to pay for our sins. There shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. Today, like never before, we're obviously looking at the heavens. We have a space station orbiting the earth 24-7 with people actually living in it. We have probes going out into outer space. We have all kinds of things that involve space where we never had before. And it says there will be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. And upon the earth there would be what? Distress of nations. We see that right now. And it talks here about nations not having solutions to the problems of this world. And it says here 
<clears throat> and uh, on the earth, distress of nations without, with, uh, excuse me, it says with perplexity. And that means without solution. They really would not have any solution. Then lastly, the sea and the waves roaring, referring to, I think, weather changes and storms and erratic weather patterns. And I think we're seeing all of that. And you've seen it this year. Uh, and it's around the world with uh, powerful storms. Uh, I think the cyclone over there in uh, the Far East killed, what, 60,000 people? And, uh, and the powerful storms have hit us in the last several years and perhaps this year. We need to pray that uh, they stay off shore, but obviously the Bible talks about fearful storms. And it says, verse 26, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things that are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Verse 20 is so interesting. When these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. These are signs that we can look at in our newspaper and see that the return of Christ is really coming up uh, perhaps soon. As we've mentioned before, whatever year Christ comes, it'll probably be on the Feast of Trumpets. I don't know what year Christ is coming, but if you were to come this year, it's celebrated for two days, September 30th and October 1st this year. If Christ doesn't come this year, then it'll be another date next year. It slides with the lunar calendar that the Jewish people uh, count their uh, days by. But if it were to be this year, then the most likely date for the return of Christ would be September 30th or October 30th. And as I understand from Jewish practice, during the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, there are a series of the shofar, the horn being blown, and then there's a final horn at the end or the conclusion of the holiday. And the Bible tells us when the last trump sounds, that then we're going to go. So if we go this year, perhaps it will be at the end of the two days when Rosh Hashanah ends that we would be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and be raptured out. Now, I didn't set the date. I didn't say that Christ was coming this year. And I'm just speculating here as to whenever Christ comes, whatever year that will take place, it'll be on the feast day. But I think it's kind of exciting to live in that excitement. I believe that beginning... Uh, uh, I guess it's Friday this week, coming up August 1st, will be uh, two months that we'll have left if Christ is to come this year. I don't know about you, but I like to live in that kind of excitement. I get up every day and say, well, I'm, kind of, I'm working against the clock. I've got two months left, and Jesus is going to be back. Now, I don't know that he will, but, you know, that gets my day excited every day. I get up in the morning and say, Wow, I'm, i got to make this day count. I'm going to do all that I can for the Lord because he could be back in just two months. And what if I said, well, I don't know, and just live my life normally without trying to be excited about this, and then he did come back. I would be regretful, wouldn't I? I'd say, oh, no, you came back too soon, sooner than I planned on. Well, we don't know the dates. So that's why we always should be excited about the return of Christ and and be doing all that we can for him while we can. But definitely, you know, people today are opening up to listen, I think, because of the price of oil, because of the uh, uncertainty of things in this world, about the danger of nuclear weapons. And we hear all kinds of rumors. How many are true, I don't know. But apparently uh, they say that some suitcase nuclear weapons have been uh, gotten by terrorists from Russia. They're not accounted for by Russia, and they're here in this country waiting for the day when they're given a signal to explode them. Wouldn't that be an awful tragedy? And apparently we hear, and you can read about it on the Internet if you want, but uh, Muslims in different cities have been told to move out of certain cities because apparently they're being warned those are cities that would be under nuclear attack. Is that just to frighten us? Maybe. Uh, could it be real? It could be. And uh, by the way, Tampa's not on that list. Uh, 
so you don't have to move out. But it's awfully frightening to think that somebody might detonate a nuclear weapon in a major city in the U.S., but no doubt that is a desire on the part of Islam to do that. And uh, we uh, could see something like that happen. Wouldn't that be a tragedy? And I certainly wouldn't uh, rule it out. But we're living in a scary time where people are concerned about these things. And it's a great time to talk to them about how to be saved. And to hopefully bring them to a saving knowledge of Christ. The verse we began with says, To as many as received Christ. When you receive Him, the Messiah, God saves you. He grants authority for you to become born again and become one of his sons or daughters. And as a result, you'll live with him forever and ever. The way we receive him, we saw in John 1.12, was to believe or to trust that he is who he claims that he is, that he is indeed the Savior that took on flesh of the seed of Abraham through Isaac and Jacob and Judah and on down all the way to uh, uh, the flesh of Mary and Mary was the was a Jewish mother of the lineage of David and that Messiah came and grew up and went to the cross just like the Isaiah prophecy gave that he would be uh, he would be killed to pay for our sins that he would be the sacrifice and those that would believe on him of course would be saved it's throughout the Old Testament and that's uh, very very exciting do I have a white piece of paper over there I'm going to illustrate what we're talking about here. I'm going to take uh, my hand and let it represent everybody here. I'm going to take my hymnal and let it represent sin. And because all of us have sinned, I'm sure you admit, would admit to that, I place it on the hand illustrating the fact that we're all sinners. Here we are, here's sin. God loves us, He hates our sin. He wants us to enter heaven, but no sin can exist in God's presence. So our problem is how can we get rid of our sin and the answer is there's nothing we could do of ourselves because the only way we could pay for sin would be by death or separation from God in hell what we need is a savior my other hand representing the Messiah or Jesus and he's God according to the Bible sinless perfect and I'm gonna let this clean piece of paper represent his righteousness according to the Bible we have to be as righteous as God in our heaven and none of us are but what happened at the cross was a trade was made. 2,000 years ago, God took our sins and laid them upon the Messiah. And he died to pay for what you and I have done wrong. He was buried and he came back from the dead. When we trust that he did that for us, God then credits our account with his righteousness. And so the believer in Christ is seen as righteous based upon the substitutionary death of the Messiah when he came the first time he died and paid for our sins we're truly living in a very exciting time and I believe that uh, uh, we're living close to when the Lord is going to come back I don't know the date and I don't pretend to and I'm not setting a date but I think it is exciting to live thinking what if he did come today what if he did come in two months uh, would that change the way I do business would that change the way I live my life would that change my excitement about this whole thing and telling people about Christ? Certainly, that passage in Ezekiel is a wonderful and incredible prophecy about people that were dead as a nation, being shaken up and moved out of the nations where they were and brought back into their own land and becoming a viable, real nation in the world again today as of 60 years ago. We're living, I think, close. And uh, no doubt about it, uh, Israel is there. It's in the news every day. And uh, it's an exciting uh, time, no doubt about it. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. With heads bowed, with eyes closed, and with no one looking around, my friend, where would you go if you were to die? And if you came today and you didn't know whether you would go to heaven or not, chances are maybe you've never understood the plan of salvation until today. And I can understand that. I was raised in church 18 years that I didn't understand. Nobody ever made it plain and clear. But right now, you could trust Jesus as being the Messiah. 
and trust that he died on the cross for your sins as the Old Testament prophets predicted that and the New Testament lays out the fulfillment of it you could trust him right now as your savior would you do that it's between you and the living God you could whisper a prayer like as follows you could say God I admit that I'm a sinner I don't understand much about the Bible but what I heard did make sense and I put my trust right now in the Messiah of Israel the one who came the first time and died to pay for the sins of the world was buried and rose again from the dead and the one who's coming again to rule over the world and establish peace on earth and the Jewish people back in their land Lord I trust Jesus right now as being the Messiah who died for me was buried and rose again from the dead I trust him right now to save me to forgive me to give me the gift of eternal life the moment you do God saves you if you're looking for a feeling don't we're never told to look for a feeling of uh, of having assurance you have something far better feelings are up and down but God's word will never change and if God said it and you believe it that settles it and God has said it it's very plainly stated in his word that as many as would receive him God would give or grant authority for you to become his sons or daughters and you would be his children and live with him forever in heaven and the way we do that is to believe or trust on his name that he is the one that he claims to be and died on the cross for our sins pray that prayer that we mentioned before God I'm a sinner I don't understand much but I do trust right now Jesus Christ as my Savior I believe he died for me and was buried and rose again from the dead I trust him right now as my only means of reaching heaven and friend the moment you do it God up in heaven would save you those watching on the internet right now I hope you would pray that prayer and trust Christ as your Savior if you have not and for those right here if you just prayed that prayer I'm gonna close in prayer we're gonna sing a chorus we're gonna go out the door no one's going to embarrass you and on purpose so you'll not be put on the spot I'm going to ask just before I pray I'd love to include you in my closing prayer I'd love to pray for you and I'm not going to embarrass you no one's going to have you forward no one is going to put you on the spot in fact we're doing it on purpose so you will not be embarrassed we're going to do it while heads are bowed and eyes are closed no one is looking except for me I've opened my eyes and I'm looking, and if you prayed that prayer just now to trust the Messiah, Jesus, as your Savior, I would like to include you in my closing prayer, but I will not identify you. No one's going to have you forward. No one's going to come running up and grab you. No one will even know except for me. Of course, God knows. And if you did that, I'd love to be able to include you as we close in prayer. Would you lift your hand right now if you prayed that prayer and accepted Jesus as your Savior? God bless you. Yes, I see your hand. Anybody else? Put it up and put it down where I can see it. God bless you over here. Yes. Anyone else? I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior right here this morning. I see your hand. God bless you. Yes. You can put them down. Anyone else? I trusted Jesus Christ right here this morning as my Savior. And I'd love to have you include me in your closing prayer. Would you pray for me? Slip up your hand and put it down. Anybody else? They would say, I did that. I trusted Christ. I prayed that prayer. I'd like you to include me as you close slip up your hand and put it back down well Heavenly Father we rejoice well, how wonderful to see three adults right here just now uh, indicate that they trusted you as their Savior Lord give them assurance give them uh, a clarity of what's going on from the Bible we pray they begin to realize they need to get into the Bible to grow in their knowledge that they're welcome here at Calvary Community Church as many times as they want to come to learn uh, with us your word we just pray for a, a great uh, uh, future for each of these as they choose now to uh, live for you and serve you not to be saved but because they are Lord bless our church as we reach out we know we're touching places around the world through the internet and many many cities uh, on the radio broadcast and we trust Lord you'll continue to uh, supply and to take care of these needs and to get us out even further 
in these remaining days. We don't know how many. We don't know what year you'll come. But we do pray that we wouldn't be sitting down doing nothing when we could be doing a great deal that would count for eternity. Give us a great day and a great week. Bless our church, the evening service tonight, the Wednesday night program, and the Awanas that begins in a few weeks. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.